During the lockdown, EU Affairs correspondent Beatrice Rios had to research and report about the pandemic from the confinement of her own home. Not being able to go into the field and see with her own eyes the results of policies really affected her journalistic work. We, she explains why she thinks that is, and we discuss, isn't that just the fate of an EU Affairs correspondent? And is reporting from the confinement of your own home bubble really that different from the Brussels bubble? Beatrice, you're the first recurring guest on, uh, uh, on Brussels Bubbles. Uh, good to have you back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so how big is the dream of being a EU first correspondent? <laughs> um, it's, it's always been my goal somehow since I started studying journalism, um, but it didn't quite turn out the way I was expecting it to be. Why not? Because I thought um, that there was a part of the story that was missing while I was reporting from Brussels. Okay, well, we're going to start the story in Liberia, because you were on a trip to Liberia, you were supposed to stay for a month, you left when everything was still fine, and then what happened? And then there was a pandemic. <laughs> um, so I left uh, mid-February, so the situation in Europe was still okay. Um, for those who don't know, Liberia is a country in the west coast of Africa that suffered from a civil war for 20 years. And when they were going back to their feet, they were hit by the Ebola crisis a few years ago. And it was a trip that was meant to be an experience on how the EU cooperation and development policy works in the field. And it turned out to be a, a trip that made me realize the scope and the impact of a uh, an epidemic in the country daily life. Yeah, because I've seen these things on the border of Congo and Uganda. People are used to washing their hands till you basically see their bones. Uh, uh, when you sneeze, you really have to go to hospital, those kind of things. Yeah, no, I, I was really impressed because when I arrived to the airport, I was already controlled, even though the situation in the country was still okay when I arrived. And then every time that I would go into a public place, I would have to wash my hands, even in the most remote areas, you would have that experience, places that had a hard time accessing water, they will ask you to wash your hands before you approach anyone. So this is the thing that we are now experiencing on a daily basis here, but for them it's just part of their life since a few years back. And in week, in week three of your one month uh, trip, you got a phone call, you have to leave now because else you're stuck here during the pandemic. You flew back to Brussels, how did the world change here? It was very strange because in a way we were not so much aware of the scope of the situation when we were in Liberia because we didn't have so much access to internet and then we arrived to our country just a few days before the lockdown uh, everyone was home, the streets were empty and the activity was practically stopped so it was very strange to move where from a place that was still okay but where you could see the uh, consequences of, a of an epidemic and then coming here and realizing that that was real life now. That was going to be our lives. What was your assignment as a EU reporter at that moment? So at the moment I work on economy uh, uh, with, uh, with a particular focus on economy. So when I came here, the whole focus was on what was the EU response to the economic consequences of the, of the pandemic in Europe. Okay, so and you, you read press re releases, you watch uh, press uh, briefings. How different was that from the way you normally operate? Well, for a new reporter, that's really strange because most of the work that we do is just meeting people, going to briefings, but having the chance to talk to experts, uh, having coffees with sources, and then suddenly you're stuck at home, you only have your phone and your laptop, but you cannot meet people, which makes a huge difference. So it was a little bit strange, the approach that we have to take in a pandemic. Yeah, and um, uh, what what's the uh, what would you have liked to report during that moment? <laughs> um, well, the thing is that when I came back from Liberia, I realized that when when we talk about such a humanitarian crisis, which was the case at the time there, and it's the case now in Europe, what matters is people and how people are coping with a situation like this. And what I would have liked to report it was about um, health workers in Spain struggling with uh, very poor conditions, uh, low wages and not having access to enough protective material, or how a lot of people were dying in nursing homes in Belgium, or how um, uh, the, the regions in Italy were shut down even before the rest of Europe realized that we were in a very difficult situation. So I wanted to report on how people were actually coping with the situation. And I, I was stuck here reporting on loans and budgets. Yeah, but before the lockdown, you did the same. You were an EU reporter. There were people all around Europe on the field and you reported the institutions. I know. I mean, in a way, I, I am aware that 
talking about all those issues, it's part of the picture. We definitely need to explain the policy making and how decisions are made and who is involved in those decisions and, and what are the the impact of those decisions. But when we when we talk to that about that, when we come to that point, it's people what we should be talking about. The lack of EU actions have consequences for people across Europe, or the action that EU takes has consequences for people across Europe. And the whole time I was missing that in a way, I was always feeling that there was part of the picture that I was not telling, but I think it became way more real when we were in the middle of a pandemic and, and I felt that we were not telling the whole story. Okay, so it was not so that your work changed so much, but your, your eyes opened of the, of the problem. Exactly. But um, you work for, for big media outlets, they have multiple journalists, you're here in Brussels covering uh, the institutions and they have other people on the ground seeing the results. Why do you need to travel to those places? First of all, I think it's, it's different uh, from national media to EU media. So when it comes to EU media, they are ma- mainly focused on policy making. They are not so much focused on the consequences of policy making or not so much focused on human interest stories. So I think that's definitely missing from the EU bubbly kind of media name it. It doesn't matter for all of them. Uh, but then when it comes to national media, I think there are two different things. First of all, national media are reporting for a national audience. So they don't have in mind uh, how that would be perceived somewhere else in Europe. But then at the same time, um, most of the time, uh, national reporters in national countries, they don't have a new perspective because they're not so much aware of the decision-making process in Brussels. They don't know uh, what those policies are and how they are affecting uh, a national level. So I think it goes both ways. So on the one hand, you have EU reporters that have an EU vision, but they are not in the field, so they are not experiencing what's happening in the different countries. And then you have national uh, um, reporters who are working in the field, but they are missing the EU perspective. But on a national or, or local level, you have a policy, the, let's build a road or a hospital, and a few weeks later, you can, as a journalist, you can go in there and watch and see, well, it, it looks like this. But EU policy, it stretches out long in time. Make a policy today, you see the effects in, in a few years from now. And also, there's always the, the national implementation that differs from country to country. So, it, it's not such a direct link between the two. It's not. There is not a, a, a direct link, but there is a link. And I think it's important to try to realize what that link is and how is it actually working. And I don't think it doesn't really it does really matter the fact that it's implemented different in different countries. Actually, I think that's important to tell. It's important to tell that story as well. That's actually the challenge of doing um, EU reporting from the field, that in the end you would have to travel to different countries to see how the situation is different. And I think it's the same for the pandemic. So I was saying before, if I would have to report on the pandemic, I would have to go to different places to see how different people are struggling with uh, decisions that are made in a different way in different countries. And I think that's part of the richness of Europe, but at the same time that we're missing that when we're reporting on the offers. But um, I hate it. I, I'm a subscriber to the NRC, the most sophisticated Dutch newspaper. I seriously consider canceling my subscription because during the pandemic, they go into villages and ask people, what do you think about the policies? Instead of asking a virologist. And they have all these human interest kind of stories. They send a journalist going to all the borders and oh, they drink a glass of wine somewhere. I don't want to read that. I don't want to read like some kind of magazine. I want to read hard news. I think it shouldn't be one or the other. I think it should be a combination. So it's a, it's a very important to understand what the decisions making uh, process is. So it's important to talk to the experts and it's important to talk to policymakers. Uh, but I think it's also important to understand how that's affecting people uh, real lives. Because what you were saying, uh, it's just I, I think it's it's missing the point of it's not so much about what do I think about the policies, how they are affecting me. So I think it's fair to ask a question to a nurse working in Spain and not having protective equipment. How does she feel about it? How is she struggling? Because she's seeing people die, die every day and she's then going home and she has to sleep separated from her family. But then um, you have just heard there's also probably there's opinion polls about all amongst all the nurses and we can say 80% of nurses think this, 20% think that instead of NS1. But that's again just part of the thing you also need for me you need to have the voice of someone explaining their own story because that gives power to what you're saying just having numbers i don't think that touch people's lives i think for me it's important to hear this story from someone someone who has a face who has a name who has a family and who is telling me how is she coping with the situation and it goes back to many different levels for me and and this is uh, i have this anecdote um 
few years ago, I had the, the chance to, to talk to Goran Tomasevic, who is a photographer from Serbia, and he started being a, a war reporter in his home country. And then he became one of the most famous reported war reporters uh, in the world. And he was explaining how it was way harder to work in his own home country, and then it became way easier to report from somewhere else. I think it's having, we're having the contrary experience now. We are so used to talk about what's happening in other countries, and then suddenly we're experiencing a pandemic ourselves, and we're not able to tell the human interest stories. Why? But I have been touched myself by the pandemic, and for me, it was way more important and, and, and it was way more understanding when I heard my mom telling me I had to go to bury my mother and I can't just be with three people in the cemetery than when I was hearing about that policy decision because it was a safety question. But shouldn't you just have become a different reporter? Uh, more of the local thing, the, the human interest, the, the, the human side of the policies and leave the, leave the bubble? I don't think so. I think again, the fact that I'm here and then I understand what the decisions and what what decisions are being made in Brussels, it's very important to understand how that then happens in the field. And but we have many, exp I, I have many examples on that. Uh, it's either the lack of action or the action of the EU, but that has impacts on people's lives. And if you don't have that perspective, it's very hard to understand and to even to talk to people and explain what the different angles of that story are when you go into the field. So it needs to be combined in basically one reporter, both the institutional side and the human side. I think the person who does it needs to understand the policy making side and needs to understand also the human angle of the story. And, and you need to have both. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the same person, but it needs to be part of the same newsroom. And I, I read your article about how the European Parliament gave one building for uh, vulnerable women in Brussels so they could sleep and eat there interesting story for Brussels local but not for me as a European reader from a different country yeah no exactly that's the thing I mean I, in this case I was just trying to bring a concrete example of the EU action when they feel that they don't have so much power but that's not EU action this was just a local office building that happens to be in Bru happens to be of the EU in Brussels helping a local with a local problem why did that have to be in a European wide news outlet because it was an action from a new institution and it was not only in brussels it was also in luxembourg and it was also in strasbourg so they were using the the means that they have available to give an extra hand given the limited uh, competencies that they have particularly the european parliament in this case okay so your your eyes have been open to how you perceive you want to do journalism how are you going to bring us into reality once we're all allowed to travel again um, well, now I happen to have the opportunity to make a change in my life for my personal circumstances and and that's what I want to do. I definitely want, this is what I wanted to do when I arrived here as a reporter. I was meant to combine both telling the story of how decisions are made in Europe uh, with the impact that that has in, the, in, the, in people's lives. When I arrived here uh, in 2015, it was in the middle of the refugee crisis, and there was this moment where I just got upset with the whole situation and wanted to stop talking about numbers and start talking about people, so I went to Greece. That's what I want to do now. I want to keep on talking about the decisions that I made in Brussels, but then trying to figure out how that's impacting people's lives anywhere else. And who, 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 what kind of topic would you like to cover the first? What's your, on the top of your list? Well, I actually have a lot of topics on, on, on my list, but one of them is um, the uh, situation of the LGBT community in Poland, which is, okay, it's only Poland. No, it's not only Poland. LGBT rights are an issue at European level because the legislations are completely different, so that has an impact on uh, freedom of movement for, for people, for instance. Um, I would like to talk about the situation of uh, NGO workers uh, in Hungary, for instance, or I would like to talk about the situation of um, migrants um, uh, in, in Italy or in Spain having to cope with the consequences of this situation. But, and there, there are a lot of stories. Are, are you better equipped to cover such kind of topics than a Polish, Hungarian or Italian journalist who speaks a language, who is on the ground, who has networks? But you can combine for those and then again, <laughs> if you are a Polish and you talk only to a Polish audience, then you're missing the whole, the whole thing, right? And again, uh, when I'm talking about LGBT rights, for instance, it's not in Poland, it's across Europe. And one of the is that you need to understand the non-discrimination legislation that it's coming from Brussels. You need to understand what freedom of movement uh, looks like. You need to know that there is a ruling from the European Court of Justice on the matter. 
that usually it's not known by national reporters, but I know it because I've been working in Brussels. And are there media outlets interesting in this kind of uh, two-level journalism? I think so, and, and I hope so. And, and again, if we don't try, we, we kind of know it. And for now, I've only seen that being done by uh, media outlets in the US, for instance. They've been doing quite a lot of work uh, in that sense, maybe because they see Europe more, more in a different way than we do because we're Europeans. So yeah, you think the, the, the Washington Post did a better job in covering what happens in Europe than European media did? Not in what happens in Europe, but they are telling one part of the story that we are not definitely telling. During the pandemic, you made some really great TV segments from what looked like the side of your bed. Uh, are we going to see more of those kind of uh, great TV from you? I hope so. Um, that, that's one of the things that I want to do as well. I'm trying to explain the EU in a, in a more simple way. Um, and I think that video is a great way to do that uh, because it, it's just connect to people, right? You talk to people like you're just having a conversation. Is the target audience in your head, is that slightly different than from the people you have been writing up to so far? Yes, definitely, because I mean, working for an EU bubble media, you know that your target is mainly EU officials and people in the bubble, so people working for lobbies or for companies. Um, and I think that the goal here will be to talk to citizens. Now, the challenge is, and I agree with you on that, is the language, because I use English for these kind of things, but not everyone speaks English across Europe. And that's a fair uh, criticism or the approach that I have uh, for this is like, how do you Build, bring the gap between um, trying to do EU reporting but touching upon different countries and then being able to reach that audience. And for that, I definitely think that the, the best solution would be to collaborate with national media. But you can bring a bubble reporter out of the bubble, but can you take the bubble out of the reporter? That's the thing, it's, it shouldn't be out of it. it should, again, it should be a combination of both. For me, it's a combination of explaining the bubble to people and then bringing the people to the bubble as well, because that's also interesting and, and that's a, a good point. What if what's missing is that people in the bubble are not hearing those stories? Maybe that's a problem. Maybe they don't understand the scope of the impact of their decision making on real people's lives. Maybe they need to hear those stories to be able to bring it into their decision making. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe I, I don't have to bring all different stories from Europe to the people in different countries. Maybe I need to bring all those different stories from different countries to the EU bubble. Wow, that sounds like a great mission. <laughs> and once you have your first things done, we gladly invite you back to the show to tell you all about your great adventures around Europe. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bea. Thank you.